Yeah. Okay. okay. Wow. Hello. Hi. <laughs> to start off with, would you like to say your name and where you are? Okay. Uh, I'm John Inku. Uh, I'm speaking now from Accra, Ghana, where I was born and where I've lived. I work from here globally. Globally, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. And the first real question is, who are you? Who are you as a person, mm. as a human being? Um, mm. And I mean, you can speak to your values, your passions, your interests, anything mm. about you, really. Okay. Well, normally when I get this question, I say, well, I, I'm a privileged uh, person from gratitude. Uh, people have been so gracious with me. I come from a very poor peasant background. Uh, both parents completely illiterate. Um, I come from a large family. My father was polygamous, had five wives. And at the time of his death, there were 41 children, 41. And I happened to be the second born of my father and the first male. Yeah. And uh, so I'm, I'm very fortunate to be where I am because there was no hope. Uh, all my siblings who are alive are nowhere near where I am in terms of uh, profession, career, publicity, whatever. Uh, so I still have my roots um, in the rural setup where I was raised. Uh, my mother is 93 now, she's still alive. Um, and so I come from that background where in Ghana, in tropical West Africa, in rural Ghana, um, we were fortunate to have gone to school. So I was one of the fortunate people who went to school um, and, and got education because of the generosity of people uh, who saw that I had some brains to learn and to apply. Uh, so that is one part of who I am. I carry that in all my identity. I never forget where I came from. And when I relate to people, that value of generosity and help, because there are many John Incomes who are stuck in this hopeless mayor. And all they need is perhaps somebody, like I was fortunate to find one or two people who lifted me up. So that's, that defines who I am and how I engage. It speaks to humility, it speaks to curiosity, it speaks to agency. Uh, because this hopelessness can be addressed. I can do something. People did something. And one person at a time is perhaps all you can do, but you have no idea what this person can also do out of what they did. So I carry that as my identity. I'm, a, I'm now a retired Baptist minister. I served 35 years as a, a Baptist minister without a fee. I volunteered myself to serve my community and the community of faith from all that God has given me by grace. And I didn't ask for money, never paid, never even got an allowance. 35 years, I retired uh, about two years ago after serving in that role, deploying what I had gained as a return. So my concept of philanthropy is not to give back to society of your excess, but to share with society whatever you have, have a small. So, so, so that's another definition of who I am. Uh, because there is a, a proverb, and for us in Ghana, especially the Ashanti or the Akan, proverbs uh, for us are consolidated wisdom from ages of experience. And there's a proverb that says, if you are waiting for big opportunities to do good, you turn out to be stingy and wicked. So I don't want to wait for an opportunity of big. I mm -hmm. share myself, I share whatever I have. And for me, therefore, when I became a consultant, it was an opportunity to deploy these extra resources to the community where I was here, where I was taken out of. I give myself, so I, I give myself a service. I don't know how many school fees of people I have paid. I don't even know them. I don't know many people I have trained um, or brought up. I don't count them because uh, I, I'm not taking record for anything, just living out uh, mm -hmm. the experience I had growing up. The other part of me is that um, I am a relational person. 
for me, if there is no relationship, I become too strategic and too unlike me. Um, so I do not look into the end game before I engage. I look into the person in front of me and what is there as attractive potential that we can do together. So I don't need to know the destination of the journey before we start. We can have a conversation and craft the destination together. That's, that defines me. And sometimes it's on Irving. It's a, it disables people who are strategic mm -hmm. uh, because I am trained as a strategic planner. I, that's what I do. But what is strategy if the humans are not there? You can have a beautiful strategy who will implement. Mm -hmm. So I believe more in relationship as a way of changing things. Uh, the fourth part of me, and then I will stop, <laughs> is, <laughs> is I believe strongly uh, in use of self and presence. So when I show up, I show up to use all of myself in order to shift the system. So most people who have met me and gained with me remember how I use myself. I, I give myself away in order to, yeah, to influence. And I've learned that the more I give of myself, the more I grow, the more I develop. Because I'm into a learning, not a performing mode in life. I mm -hmm. want to learn. Uh, what legacy do I hope to leave with the use of myself, my presence, that people will become better after they've met me? or engage with me hmm. in their own way, uh, supporting them on their own journeys without taking any credit for it. Uh, hmm. Because how can I go back and thank all the people who lifted me out of that poverty, of that, I, I, can't, I can't. So I just live to say that, yes, we can do a lot of things. And so I don't get militant. I get rather relational. I, when I see the protests and the things that are going on on Black Lives Matter, I say, yeah, I know this. I live it daily in my life. There is a way we could do this in conversation. There's a way we could do this through dialogues, through creating the space. People do what they know. And so maybe the way is to, yeah, let them know different. And so militancy, um, has a place, uh, but it's not in all situations. So I'm more dialogical, I'm more conversational. I believe in the human spirit and human ability to change. And so I'm pathologically optimistic about human life. <laughs> there are definitely worse things that you could yeah. have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and then my experience uh, has not always been pleasant from that stance but it hasn't brought me to a place of giving up in the human spirit. Uh, some, some creation that can bring change and needs love. So that, that's where I function. So this is this who I am. Hmm. As, as you're speaking, I'm just suddenly, I can just, the image that comes into my mind is just this tree and I'm just seeing these incredibly deep reaching roots. I don't know why I'm getting that image in my mind, but... Well, you are not the first to say that. A lot of people <laughs> say they are amazed at the depth of my grounding. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I don't know, but somehow I've become fearless hmm. out of hope and trust. Because I believe that love does not fear. Hmm. Uh, so I have deep roots. Uh, in my culture, in my society, in the human person uh, as a representation of something more than just money and wealth and fame and status. Uh, we are here to, yeah, to affect our societies, uh, not to amass wealth for ourselves. I, I have pity for people whose definition of life is in how many billions they own. Uh, I have pity for them because I don't think they, they understand the purpose of life fully. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I yeah, that, that, that's how deep I am. I'm embedded in human nature, in human goodness, and the ability of humans to shift and to self-organize and to self-improve. Mm -hmm. if, if I look back into human history, uh, how we have evolved, it's all been in search of excellence in search of improvement. 
And so when the negative hits us, I see it as an opportunity to excel, to, be, to become better at ourselves. Uh, and so I see obstacles and problems as opportunities for recalibrating, opportunities for rescaling, retooling, rather than go for somebody else who is in the same dilemma. He's mm -hmm. also learning to appreciate. And we are, we are all students in this life journey. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's every once in a while when I do these interviews, I have the feeling that my questions suddenly seem very small. So I'm no, having that feeling right now. You no, know, it's your questions are very helpful in, uh, in self discovery. It's enabled me to, as I share the narrative, uh, speak to my, my identity, myself, my, my being in the world with those two small questions. Mm -hmm. You open great doors into the human spirit the human soul yeah so and 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 uh, and that's the relational part of me because why would you ask this if you are not interested why would you do this if it didn't have meaning for you you know so uh, if it was my turn to interview then i'll be asking the question uh, <laughs> what does this mean for you, you know? so i mm -hmm. think i'm hearing that already from the yeah. statement you are making but the point for me in life is we go to school, we learn skills, we acquire knowledge, we build up structures. I say, what for? Uh, if it is not to leave a legacy, to make other people better, to make other people better, I mean, then what is the effort of, I mean, what is the essence of this effort? If you're 100 years, 120, you are begging to die. Is that all you came into this life to do? Mm -hmm. uh, to accumulate money and leave it behind. You have no control of the people, how they will use your wealth after you've left. Mm -hmm. What you have control of is how you can influence them to become human beings. Mm -hmm. And that for me is the essence of life. Mm -hmm. That's why I love Gestalt, uh, because of the human, you know, the, it's a humanistic model. Yes. It's a needs fulfillment model to enable people fulfill their needs. And so most often I, when I use myself, I ask myself the question, what's my need? What do I want? What, mm -hmm. what will make the others you know, around me not be exploited, but enabled? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So uh, I, I like to always say this. Uh, one of our you know, participants in an international program that I, I co-lead, I said something in passing, which I captured and, and emphasized to us all and to me in particular, that I don't have to be right because somebody is wrong. Mm -hmm. It's a very small statement, but very powerful. Can that person be right? And I can also be right. Can two rights sit together? One doesn't have to be wrong before mm -hmm. the other is right. So it's a frame of, of being in the world. To give and value. And it's, a, it's a frame with no arrogance, which is nice. It's, it's a, it's a, non, it's a non arrogant, non combative. It's a multiple realities. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, a, it's a world in the Gestalt language of multiple realities. So my reality is not the reality. There are other realities. And will I be humble enough, non combative, non violent, to appreciate? Why are people seeing the world, engaging the world different from the way I see it and engage it? Mm -hmm. And isn't that interesting that we could have this difference? You know? Why must one go down so that I can rise? If the only definition of my going up is to destroy or stamp on somebody, um, then am I really a human being or a machine? You know? So, so the, there are a lot of questions in my mind about mm -hmm about this gestalt in organizations mm -hmm. that have become my practice. Yeah. Okay. But before I get into the gestalt in organizations, I mean, you've talked a bit about your circumstances and, you know, part of your origins, but I'm curious what comes to mind as a particular event in your life that you would say really changed you or shaped you? Uh, there are two. There are two these events. Uh, the first one was very early in my life when um, going to school, I had passed what we call in Ghana those days, the common entrance examination to secondary school. 
there was a national exam that admitted people from elementary school to secondary school. And I had passed uh, with a national scholarship. I mean, coming from a very rural, you know, outbacks. Um, I happened to be among the first five percentiles of people without knowing what I was doing. Um, so I got a national scholarship, but my father said, no, I'm the first son after he inherit his estate. And he was a rice mill operator mm. and uh, with all those wives and children, and he wouldn't pay the school fees. So I didn't go. Then second year, I passed again with the same national scholarship. Again, he wouldn't let me go. So I finished middle school, which is uh, in Ghana, 10 years of early education with the distinction and passed again. And my father said, no, you are not going to second year school. So I started working in the mill. And then one of my mother's friends, who was a stranger, not a family member, saw me and saw my grades. He, he knew me and said, you don't belong here. So he used his money, took me with permission from my mom, not my dad, and mm -hmm. tried to seek the schools that had admitted me. And uh, I like to share the story because uh, the last school we went to, and he was about to give up, the headmaster said, yeah, we see this candidate, but this is the second term, the third week, and we cannot admit anybody, third week of the second term in a three-term year. Mm. Um, so, um, sorry. So this nice man, uh, Mr. Edu, begins to turn away and is leaving, which meant for me the opportunity to go to the secondary school was lost. So I looked into the headmaster in his eye, and I remember saying to him, sir, uh, if I qualify, then give me the chance, because when I go back, I will only become a rice mill operator. My father doesn't see me having secondary education. And please, if it's in your power to change my destiny, here I am before you. Even in all these years, I recall this with emotions. And I must have had tears in my eyes or something in my voice. So this headmaster then said, upon your words and the way you speak so eloquently, I will take you. That's how I got secondary education. It changed my life from being in the rural rice mill to being an international consultant in Odi. It's a, it was a life-changing moment that I always remember. The generosity of one man and another. Through dialogue. Through a dialogue. Not through power. No, sharing my, my need. Just mm -hmm. exposing my vulnerability. So I think it taught me how to be influential with vulnerability. Mm. That everybody has a loving heart. Everybody has a place of softness from where they grow. Mm -hmm. And if you can find it, you can work with them. Hmm. So th that was the first, um, you know, in, in, in terms of changing my life. That was the first experience. And, and so I came to understand that humans, a fellow human being, can shift my destiny. And I can shift other people's destiny if I would be open to be reached, to be touched. Hmm. So when I see all this, you know, uh, barriers, these armors we wear around our hearts, these shields to protect ourselves. I, I recognize that, no, if you can go behind the shield, behind the armor, there's a human being uh, who can be reached. Uh, so I've learned to navigate my relationship with people uh, when they are not in armor. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah, you are disarming. Yes, you are. Were you going to, was there a second moment that you wanted to mention? Yeah, well, the second one was much, much later in life when um, I became a student leader, an activist, because I believe in social, social inclusion, justice and equity. So Coming from my background, it was natural for me to fight for the underprivileged, uh, women, vulnerable, disabled, you know, 
pressed. So I found myself as a student leader, um, advancing the course of the underprivileged. Um, so I even acquired a nickname uh, <laughs> during this in school. But the point of departure, which translated my life was, um, I thought activism, being an advocate for the poor, being a little outspoken, speaking truth to power, being audacious, um, was the way to go. And then, you know, I left university and got involved in the politics and trying to drive change and recognize that, no, there was still an emptiness because people were playing uh, what they thought they needed in order to rule. And I, I recognized, no, I'm not doing this to rule. I'm doing this to be served. I mean, to serve. Mm -hmm. and, and I recognized at that stage, there's a difference between a leader and a ruler. And so I wanted to be a leader, not a ruler. And I left the politics and, mm -hmm. and Christ found me. So I became a Christian. Um, and many, many people then began to ask me, what, what disaster has befallen you? That you, a Maoist, Leninist, um, leftist, you know, because one of my nicknames was Comrade, uh, because I stood for the oppressed. You know. mm -hmm. How could you then turn out to be this you know, Christian leader, pastor, you know, very different? And I said, well, there's a theology for the oppressed. And if I understand uh, the scripture, the Bible very well, it is, a, if you like, it's an ideology for the oppressed. Um, you know, so I got very hooked into how to do the world differently from love, mm -hmm. how to engage advocacy, how to engage uh, duty bearers, how to, uh, how to support the oppressed through dialogues. And so when I got into seminary, uh, I joined the College of Preachers to understand how to deliver the word of love and the word of belonging to both divides, to, to pull down the walls of hostility and to bring humankind to in touch with itself. So mm -hmm. that is the translation, uh, the new translation in my life uh, that has become who I am. Uh, I see goodness in everyone. I, uh, I see the potential for shift in everyone. Mm -hmm. And so my optimism that the human spirit is, is able to change. Uh, sometimes I look at the news in the, and I say, uh, Trump is possible. It's possible for Trump to be different. It's possible. It's really possible. We're remotely some, possible. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if somebody will find his heart mm -hmm. and he has one. If somebody will give him respect for himself, he has mm -hmm. his self-respect. There's something driving uh, that if we could find, I believe strongly that we could, we could do this. I'm not saying there are not um, uh, wicked people around. There are. Uh, but why would anybody become wicked? Because he has an understanding uh, of life um, that makes him do what he's doing. You know, so, um, and it, this part of me or this character of mine is so well known that uh, when armed robbers attacked me in my house, in my family, with guns and cutlasses and machetes and took away everything, cut me in the head, brutalized my wife and children and took away everything, it was a Saturday evening. I would, I had been to hospital with my family, we got in some first aid and all that, but I wanted to go to church on Sunday. So Sunday morning with swollen faces and bruises, we were in church with bandages. And when people saw and learned about it, one of the church leaders asked me, so Pastor John, if you found these robbers, what would you do to them? I said, I will begin to dialogue with them about why they do that. I need to understand what drives them. If they know different, they would do different. I mean, they couldn't believe that I was not bitter. I was hurt, but I was in search of this human spirit that had engaged the world through violence. What is, dry, what is the database that informed their behavior? 
working. So yeah, that you ask the two things that transformed me. It's about the people who enabled me to get education. It's about the church community that did not throw me away, but welcomed me with all my history. And why would they throw you away? Because I was violent. Hmm. I was I was not good. Hmm. And my, I, I didn't need to be good to be accepted. I needed to be accepted so that I can become good. Hmm. And I do the same. I accept people trusting that they will become good. Hmm. And everyone has that possibility. Hmm. For me, then, this is guest out. Optimism. Mm -hmm. Very much. Yeah. I'm also curious who you've met. I mean, you've mentioned a couple people, but is there a particular figure in your life, a person who you'd say has really changed who you are through that in contact? Most, yeah, in most recent times, um, well, I mentioned Mr. Edu, the, the man who used his own resources, took me to the headmaster. So those two, Mr., you know, the headmaster, Mr. Oklu, who had a heart that a young village boy could touch. Mm. Um, Wow, I'm emotional with that. But but that's those two names, Mr. B.K. Oklu of Blessed Memory and Mr. Edu of Blessed Memory. Mm. They showed me very early in my life that humans have possibility to enrich other humans. And mm. uh, then in recent times, um, there are two people, they call themselves uh, uh, business couple. They are, they are not married, they, they are just colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, Marianne Rene of the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland, when I met her, and Jonah Hanafin. Now they both run the IGO program, the International Gestalt Organization Leadership Program, that I'm part of the faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so in most recent time, these two people have contributed a lot, a lot in shaping me about how I am in the world and engage with the world. Um, as they took me in their wings to co-create this project mm -hmm. um, called the International Goal uh, Gestalt Organization and Leadership Development, and my role in it as I deliver that program and grow and learn, uh, anchoring that against my Christian practice as, as a preacher, as a Baptist minister. Uh, those two things uh, have helped me a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes uh, I need to say uh, in this interview, as I say in private sometimes, that um, if, you, if you allow people, they will take you out of your center. And you need to know your center to be able to engage for your growth. Mm -hmm. And when I didn't know my center, what I held dear, what my purpose in life was, what I want for myself in this world. Uh, I was more malleable, more, yeah. But as soon as I discovered the essence of my life, it was easy to take you know, support uh, to, to grow, to shape me. And I am grateful for Marianne and Jono for uh, putting me there because they may not be aware of what I'm saying, but there's something the two of them kept saying. Why are you always deferring to people? Take your stand on issues. And I, as I practice to take my stand uh, mm -hmm. on issues and to deploy resources to enrich my stand, not to, de to deny other people's stand, but to strengthen my stand for myself so I can appreciate the difference between my stand and other people's stand, and to therefore have a basis for dialogue. You know, so uh, this has been very helpful. So yeah, two two groups of people: two men, one man, one lady. But two in Ghana and two in the U.S. Uh, have mm -hmm. shaped my life. Yeah. Uh, it may interest you that I am not talking of people in the church who have shaped my life, because my experience in the church has been different. Mm -hmm. And being what I shouldn't do to others. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. And now I appreciate strongly why I know Jesus Christ was so different in his relationship to the Pharisees and the scribes. 
mm -hmm. the, you know, that he met. Mm -hmm. Because they had a way the world should be lived. Mm -hmm. They didn't accept that Jesus had a different way to live in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I found that in the church. There's a way to be a church leader, to be a preacher, to be a Christian. Their way is not always God's way. And so I mm -hmm. don't, yeah, it's really funny how mm -hmm. Other people understand God's mind and want you to, to give up your understanding of God's mind. To, to, to be there. I find it so interesting. I can imagine. Okay. So I say Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel for the ragamuffin. Okay. It's not, it, it's not a gospel for the emperors. Mm -hmm. If they are interested, they could be helped, but actually, uh, it is, there's no status quo that Jesus had established that everybody should comply. Jesus is welcome to every heart that is in search of him. Okay. So, as, as a man of God, as a man of many things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's interesting. So this, yes. is, this is another, another slightly more personal question, um, which is, how you understand yourself as a man, how you understand yourself in mm. terms of gender and your identity. Mm. Ah, well, that's a good one. Well, I'll be brief here because my understanding of human is that we were created in the image of God and God is sex neutral. He functions as a woman, he functions as a man, he functions as a spirit. And so I am just in this casing that is defined as male, mm -hmm. but a lot of me um, is female. And so long ago in my growing up, being the first son in a polygamous home, uh, when my father was the husband of five adorable women, uh, some of whom he didn't love, I became the son for all the five women. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I learned to be an advocate for the under, underprivileged, the oppressed. And so for me, gender equality, social inclusion, uh, diversity and belongingness is natural. It comes to me natural. Um, and as I said, my fight for equality has stopped being militant, it being dialogical. So, I work a lot in the, until last year I didn't do much, but previous years I worked a lot with the, the Federation of Disabled Organizations in Ghana. All the disability structures in this country, they are into a federation. Mm -hmm. And I used to volunteer my services, uh, doing a lot of work for the underprivileged and the vulnerable. So for me, diversity goes beyond gender divide. There are several nuances. Uh, class divide, status divide, a, a lot of them. The believer, the non-believer, you know, who am I to say that if somebody is not in church, he's a sinner? I was. I mean, this, this kind of languaging uh, of framing others who, who are not like us as being less than us. It's, um, I'm, not, I'm not like a woman. But I appreciate mm -hmm. the difference, and I love that difference. Uh, there's a second uh, angle to this, because I understand the male-female issue, the gender issue, as one being a counterpart, a complement to the other. Uh, because scripture says, God saw that it was not good for the man to be alone, and created for him a woman. I know from my own life, I've been in a relationship with my wife for 43 years, we've been married for 38 years. And I know every day that I'm alone and she's not there, I'm not complete. That I'm, sorry, but when I wake up and I see this independent, godly woman still by my side, I, I, I get into praise and honor. What have I done to deserve you? Teach me to do more.
Did I touch you with that? Mm-hmm. It is. I, I mean, see. it's appreciation. I see it's that. Thank love you. Love and appreciation. Love. Thank you for allowing me. Mm-hmm. But you asked about who I am around I the gender. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I'll tell you. And I mean, for me, that says very much, not because it's just, you know, man, wife, gender roles, but the way that you are being with her as a man. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Hmm. With, with all my flaws, then, do I still qualify for anyone <laughs> to, <laughs> to invest to their lives with me this way? I, I mean, every morning, you, when you hold our hands to pray, I don't forget to say thank you for me. Hmm. Still. Hmm. So I'm also curious about Gestalt. I'm imagining hmm. that you have a relationship with Gestalt as well. Very How did you so. find it? How did yeah. it find you? <laughs> yes. Um, well, I graduated as uh, a development planner, development mm-hmm. management. Um, so in 88, uh, I was practicing in Ghana. Uh, and there's uh, uh, Johan Lohmeyer, whom you have interviewed, came to do some work with the GIZ, the German Development Corporation. Mm-hmm. And I had gone to Germany uh, under a German scholarship to study for my master's. And during the study, they had introduced um, the German Development Corporation planning tool. Those days, they call it SOP, or T-Oriented Project Planning, Objectives-Oriented Project Planning. Later on, became well known as Lock Frame methodology. Mm-hmm. So I had, during my studies, interrogated that methodology and questioned its applicability to the African context, especially in rural, illiterate societies uh, because of the instruments that were embedded in that methodology. And I had made suggestions. So I think um, when Dr. Lomaya had this job, I think I was pointed out to him by one of my lecturers, uh, Shah, Nicholas Shah, that there's a guy in Ghana who interrogates. (laughs) He was asking some (laughs) questions, yeah. So he came, he worked with me. Uh, cut a long story short, we became very close colleagues and we used mm-hmm. to run project management in Berlin uh, mm-hmm. for African and Asian and uh, Southeast Asian project leaders. So this project management program, training program in Berlin is where Johan Luma and I and others like Chantel. So during those days, um, in the 90s, I think 91, 92, there were 12 of us in the training team, uh, 10 Germans and two Africans, myself and Nathan, Nathaniel Njima from Tanzania, were the two Africans on the 12-man team, uh, well, 12 persons team. And so uh, we said we needed supervision to see how our, our work was going. So I think Johan Lohmeyer found for us uh, a psychologist in the Technical University of Berlin, you know, Sherry Wouters and the husband, uh, who came and uh, went with us. Yeah, they, both of them were gestaltists. And so I got very interested in the gestalt approach, which was not um, instrument, but relational. Mm-hmm. I wanted to, you know, it's about you, who you are, how you engage, what informs how you engage, what are you in search of. And so this self-discovery uh, and how I became very in- interesting for me. Uh, and so uh, they, Shelley recommended, Shelley and the husband uh, recommended for us 12 to go into this Gestalt OD training, uh, which was then based in Cleveland, Ohio, in the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland. That's how I got into Gestalt. Um, and I, I was even given a scholarship uh, by the Gestalt Institute to study uh, this methodology. And since I entered there, it was so akin, aligned to my in, inner nature, my very self, 
that uh, I remember you know, one of the pioneers, and I met, I worked with the pioneers, I studied with them. Um, uh, yeah, it said to me, um, you are so gestalt by nature. <laughs> and I said, well, that's how I have been shaped. I've been formed around people and my engagement, the boundary of myself and the others, and I can influence, you see, myself. So, so that's how I got introduced to Gestalt, and I've stayed since that time, since 92. Mm. I've been involved in Gestalt till now, and uh, I think I'm going to die Gestaltist. <laughs> well, you, you can retire from the ministry, but you're going to die a Gestaltist. That's... Retired from the ministry. That is very I'm, deep. I'm, I'm going to stay Gestalt, because I found that being Gestalt, I could do ministry differently. Mm -hmm. Being a child, I can be a husband and a father differently. Mm -hmm. I can be another human being differently. Mm. Uh, because uh, the child teaches me to respect multiple realities. The child teaches me to honor the other in discovery mm. and to be interested and curious rather than judgmental. Mm -hmm. The child teaches me to be optimistic and not pathological. Mm. That's the good there. People are doing the best they can uh, in the moment. If they get to know differently, they will respond differently. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. how I got into this stuff. And, and how has that changed you as a person? I mean, I'll ask about how it's changed your practice and what you've done with it, but how yeah. has it changed you as a person? Well, it moved me from being right to being curious. It moved me from um, being driven to, to embrace it. Uh, it. It changed me from, from the inside that there are others that I should be curious about, that it's not about me. That there's something about me I, others may need, but there are things about people that I may also need. So this, this is the core change. Um, and, and primarily that I'm in this world, whether I like it or not, I lead, I influence. Whether I know it or not, people look up to me and I influence people. Am I aware what I'm doing and how people's destinies are impacted because they encountered me? Mm -hmm. That sense of responsibility and humility is a shift. Mm -hmm. from we know what is right, you are wrong, you have to provide this for the oppressed, you, you have to, rather than, I've shifted from there to I, I can do this, I mm -hmm. can embrace, I can do something, yeah, so these are yeah. fundamental shifts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking, you know, you said from ruling to leading. That's right. And I'm just coming back to the sense of presence, and it's just, yeah. it's the being, it is, yeah. there's, I, I mean, your presence is coming through. The, you're you. filling up the room that I'm sitting in in Mexico right now. So <laughs> Thank you. That's that's a lot. That's a lot you of know, responsibility people, yeah, with all of that. Exactly. Presence. Exactly. If people define themselves as change agents, I define myself as an awareness agent. Mm -hmm. All I can do is to enhance people's awareness and trust that they will bring the change that they mm -hmm. need for themselves. It's a humility there, but it's a power, uh, very soft. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then there is something about creative indifference, uh, being impactful without being in control. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do I enable people to make better journeys in their lives without being hailed as the person who did it? Mm -hmm. Well, I believe that by my engaging with other people, they enrich my journey also. Every time my, the narrative of my life um, is from my engagement with other people. So that's what my present, yeah, I love it. Mm -hmm. I, I yeah, and I'm, I'm just trying to reconcile the ideas of, or, of development work, which seems to have an end and mm. creative indifference. Mm, this is a beautiful question. Yeah. That's a beautiful question. You know, before I went into Gestalt, 
I had practiced development from 1977 to 1991. And my understanding of development is that you create a project with an end in view, and you deliver certain activities and products people consume towards a defined trajectory. Uh, well, that is a way of playing God. So when I came to the star, I recognized, no. That's why there are so many strategic plans and development projects on shelves mm -hmm. where the people haven't changed or developed. So I recognize that development is actually about people, not about projects. Mm -hmm. Development is more the internal shifts in people's appreciation of self and the other, rather than what they can do. It's about being rather than doing. Mm -hmm. So that is the great shift. Uh, and the, 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 you know, the interface, if you like, the nexus of development and gestalt is that if people get to know who they are, and what they want in the world, it is easy to create a common ground on which they can function together mm -hmm. to do something mutually beneficial uh, for themselves and for the environment that contains them. Mm -hmm. So I believe strongly that development is not to destroy the Amazon because we want some temporary gains. But how do we coexist with the Amazon for generations yet to come to also mm -hmm. engage the Amazon? You know, so that, that for me is the shift that the child has brought to my appreciation of, of development. Uh, it's not to create an end and drive people towards it or enable people to get there, but to create a definition of self mm -hmm. in context that people own and they will drive, they will develop. If you have I, I like that you bring context into that because if it's, it can't just be the individual, you have to have conditions. I mean, Maybe that's where the comrade comes in. Uh, that's where the, yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's where it is. Uh, pr primarily, you know, if you have a systems perspective of life, as Gestalt will teach you, then the small thing I'm doing here has repercussions, you know, because if you are a systems believer, you believe in systems, you, you believe in the, you know, in the principle of you know, forces, the force field in which we function. What we are doing, you and I, Heather, has repercussions beyond us that we have no idea of. Maybe 10 years from today, somebody will look at this video and say, my life is changed because Heather asked John a question and John said this, and John said this, that touched Heather. So we don't know what we are creating here and what will happen um, in the force field of human existence. So that's, that's where my humility comes from. Mm -hmm. But also I'm aware of the power and not to abuse it. Hmm. And so, I, I mean, I know you've already changed my day and from there, <laughs> the, the, rest, the rest will come. So what, what is your work? That what would you say has defined your work? Not like a legacy. I, I imagine you still have quite a few things to do. But <laughs> yes. what have you done I, with all of this? I think my work has primarily in the past. Um, let's say, let me let's say from the nineties till now, the work that I've been busy doing uh, is to use myself to improve others, to improve myself and others. Mm -hmm. So I have used language like my non pulpit ministry is the leadership, the start leadership thing I do. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my work has been that everybody that I meet becomes a better version of themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, my work has been that if um, I receive resources, from work I've done with people who pay me, that money is meant to improve other people. So I use my money, myself, to enrich others, to improve others. And so, um, yeah, uh, my work has been to be a better human being for other human beings. And I, I'm curious now how this has, I have a feeling it's done something. How has this changed the rice mill? How has this changed specifically where you came from? 
my siblings and uh, my mom is still alive. Uh, they gave me a nickname, the Abraham of the family. I think in one generation, I have moved um, my family, my extended family, where I was, the rock from where I was in. I've moved them from depravity, deprivation, poverty, hopelessness, to hope, victory, and celebration. Um, from a completely illiterate background, family, I was the first to go to secondary school ever. We now have master degree holders in that family. We have people who are employing others in that family. Uh, there's still a lot to be done because there's still a large portion still you know, that we have to drag out of, of that mud. Uh, and that work continues. But we are also busy polishing the gems that we have brought out of the mine. Mm. Uh, this is the but thank you. The work continues. Yeah. Hmm. Because you don't seem like a person who would just leave somewhere and then build something somewhere else and not not reach back. Yeah. No, Heather. That's why all the people, there were 12 of us friends in the university. We are still in contact on WhatsApp. The bridge we used to call us Queen's Hall was the hall, University Hall of Residence mm -hmm. that, that I was in, in Kumasi University of Science and Technology. 12 of us who became very close friends in that, I'm the only one still in Ghana who never emigrated. Those who are back in Ghana lived outside for over 30 years. I've seen two or three who have come back, but I've, I never emigrated because I had a call on my life that God in his wisdom created us and planted us in different parts of the world and put the search for him in our hearts. And if we look for him, he will enable us to prosper and to make a difference where he planted us. I never emigrated. I am not a quitter. I believe yeah. that when I encounter issues, it is to empower me, enrich me. If I engage with it in humility and in curiosity, I will learn to be able to master myself, to be able to bring a change for me and others mm -hmm. around me. And so if you like, I've been a missionary uh, in different ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what about, what about those challenges? Which ones in your life have really moved you? When have you almost, you know, given up on a part of yourself? I think I'm still dealing with the frustration of why there's so much evil and deliberate oppression and denial of other people's uh, being. I still struggle with that. It comes to a place where I was watching the video the other day about the uh, white militancy, the right wing and the black militants who were armed. I was watching the video of the US and I wept. I said, we don't need this. Yeah. With all the abundance of resources and possibilities in the US of A, really? What would you do if you were living in Ghana? <laughs> if, if you were, what would you Those do? Those wouldn't last a week. <laughs> so yeah, it brings me to a point of despair sometimes. Mm -hmm. But then I kick myself up and say, they're only doing what they know. If they know different, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, why would you collude with somebody who wants to buy another human being from you to enslave <laughs> and to destroy? Why would my ancestors sell off? Like, why? What do you want? Gold? What do you want? And so, yeah, sometimes I'm almost in the bridge of giving up on human. Mm -hmm. And this persistent inability to let others be better 
after mm. encountering me. Uh, but I'm still in the hope that, yeah, it will happen. Mm. It may take a while, but it will happen. But I know good triumphs over evil. It's a matter mm. of time. Mm. And this, this, excuse me, this, this question might be a little too far, but you seem like a person who at some point in your life has probably met someone who's wanted to kill you. Yeah. And I'm curious how you, how you face that. Wow. Okay. If, if the, the one that is most vivid is when the armed robbers came to my house. <sighs> 2009, mm. January. And they broke into the house and kid knocked me down and their leader put his boots on my head, stamped on my face and broke my jaw, broke my teeth and pointed a gun at me. And as I was down there and I had been trained not to look them in the eye because if they knew I could identify them, they would kill me. Mm -hmm. so, I closed my eyes, looked away, and I was saying in my spirit, Father, forgive him. Let him not kill anyone. Let him take whatever he likes because he needs it. But help me. Help my home, help my family. So, well, I, they, I think they were in the house for about half an hour, 30 minutes enough time to collect whatever brutalize us uh, when he gave the last command for them to run and he lifted his boot off my face on my head and i suppose he he thought i would run after him but i didn't i laid there went on my knees and thanked god for sparing our lives and asked god to have mercy on them that they need something in the world, they don't know how to get it. Mm. And then I said, help me to meet them one day and show them love and gratitude. And so I think two years ago, uh, I met two of them who were looking for a house to rent and didn't know that the house being offered to them was my house where they came to rob me. Mm -hmm. So I only asked the question, um, would you be able to live peacefully in the house where you have robbed people there before? And I think the leader saw suddenly that I recognized him. And when he looked that way, I said, when we forgive each other, everybody becomes better. Then he mm -hmm. knew I wasn't going to get him arrested or anything. Well, cut a long story short, they couldn't take the house. Uh, and I didn't look for him. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you gave him something to think about. I think we all have, we are teachers for mm -hmm. other people if you embrace our roles. Mm -hmm. He could have killed me. Why he shot the gun into the ceiling? I don't know. Hmm. Then other people who have sought to kill me were not so physical, but maybe emotional or professional. Mm -hmm. As um, an associate minister, I worked with my head pastor for over 20 years, I think from 1988 till 2000, till, till last year. Um, in full service, absolute surrender and support. I don't know what happened in our relationship but suddenly I fell out of favor, searched to know what I could do different, but he said everything is okay, but systematically sidelined me, uh, put me, so I was emotionally hurt and dangerous. I had to find refuge under another head pastor's care. And decided that I won't quit that church. I will stay mm. there and serve my God because it is not for any human being to determine where I live in this world. It's for me. 
Oh my God. So I'm back and I'm grateful for the experience. Mm -hmm. I rejoice serving God in that same space. I give of myself and I recognize how much I'm in demand to share God's word and my experience. For me, Christianity is practice. It's mm -hmm. practical living. It's not ideological. For me, therefore, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Mm. Mm. <sighs> well, I, I also want to know not about only the death parts, but what, what are some of those most enriching moments in your life? Some of the highlights? or a particular moment that you would say this is fulfillment? Yeah. Um, Heather, I have learned to collect my gems, to polish them and to celebrate mm -hmm. them so I can get energy to go back into the mind. Mm -hmm. So there are several moments, several trophies. They, they have the purpose of encouraging me to go back into the mind, not to sit and celebrate them. Mm -hmm. So there are moments and, and things, gems that are, you know, of the people in my family who have education, who have master's degrees, who, uh, there are people who worked with me when I set up my consulting firm, who have become bigger consultants than I am, <laughs> more powerful, richer. There are people who I have worked with, trained, they, they call me their mentor, their trainer, whatever, who are in much higher positions, much better off. These are my trophies. Uh, people who have, whose school fees I've paid, who are in different you know, status in life, pastors, you know, civil servants, society leaders. Uh, I see them, I rejoice. And it gives me energy to say that I could do more. So my trophies are the humans whose life I've affected. Mm. Uh, I don't have much material wealth or prosperity, but I have a joyful heart. Mm. That I came into the world to touch people and to be touched by people. That's, these are my trophies. No doubt. No doubt. <laughs> So I guess the last thing that I really ask is what's next? I mean, what, what is next for you in your life? And that's where you know, I am. I'm also where curious you, about where you see Gestalt going, but that's kind yeah. of background at this point in the conversation. <laughs> well, yesterday I took time to breathe and to write a few notes for myself going forward. I want to, I want to, spend more time with me to watch movies, to write books, to document my experience in life. I want to spend more time loving this woman who has tolerated me and, and stayed with me. All this. I, I, I like to return a lot more of me to her and to the, yeah. Uh, I, going forward my, the rest of my life, um, I want to spend more time uh, with her, to be softer, not to be driven uh, by our needs, but by who we are together. Uh, interesting is that uh, when we met, I didn't even own a radio, but she stayed with me. We, we bought our first radio together. And she's been with me all this while. Uh, we've raised five adult children. Um, our last baby is now trying to get admission for a master's degree. Uh, we've come a long way together. And I think we need to uh, yeah, round up our lives together differently. Uh, I like to slow down with myself and watch a little more movies to be wiser for myself and others, to get in touch with other people's perspective more differently and to document my experience uh, for others to recognize that you don't get less if you share yourself. That's probably yeah. what I want to do. 
Yeah, I'd, I'd be looking forward to the memoirs, to your writings, to mm -hmm, your teachings yeah. in many yeah. senses. <laughs> so I joined a writer's residency recently by the NTL Institute. Um, and my colleagues and the, and the facilitators said to me that I have a story to share. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, <laughs> so I agree. I, I will do that, yeah. And what about Gestalt? What, what do you think it could or should be doing in the world? I think, I think um, Gestalt ought to be more than it is. I think all of us in the field of Gestalt need to present the wealth, the potential, the power of Gestalt a little more than we have done up till now. It's a small club of people who are aware of what Gestalt is and what it can do. But I think if the world needs anything more today than ever, it is Gestalt. The world needs to understand that human nature is always in search of excellence. And that we, we don't get less when others become more. I think we need to offer the optimism Gestalt has to others, that there's hope for humanity. We don't need to destroy our environment to enjoy life. I think Gestalt, um, I would say, if, if the world needs anything today more than anything else, they need Gestalt. Um, well, I'm just grateful for speaking with you right now. And I don't know if there's anything else you would like to add. No, I just want to thank you for the opportunity for me to share with you and whoever would hear us later, who have been enabled to become. It's other human beings who have made me who I am. And I thank you that I could share myself with you and others. I'm grateful. Mm. Well, thank you.